Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Bauhoff of the uh, Center for Subsurface Energy and the Environment. Uh, I am currently the director of the center, although that this is my last week as director. I've been director for about three and a half years. I'm also a professor in the Hildebrand Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering, and I'll be starting my role next week as department chair. But don't worry, uh, Kishore Mahanti will be taking over as interim director of the center, and this webinar series will continue. To learn more about the research that we do, please visit our website, as well as follow us on uh, LinkedIn and uh, join our YouTube channel. So a little bit more about us. Uh, we're a group of uh, about 25 principal investigators and faculty who work on all aspects of uh, subsurface energy and the environment. Uh, some of the research that we do in the center um, includes a variety of subsurface applications. We use different technical disciplines and apply engineering tools. One of the ways we collaborate with industry is through our industrial affiliate programs, a few of which are listed here. Uh, in terms of our webinars, um, these are monthly. They are informative industry driven webinars by researchers and our collaborators in the center. They are typically hosted the second Tuesday of each month at noon via Teams. Uh, we may reevaluate that uh, day in the future, but right now, second Tuesday of each month. And uh, these, if you're unable to attend live, you can uh, visit our YouTube channel where all of our webinars are uploaded after the fact. Uh, we have um, over 25,000 views of all of our webinars in the last three years. Uh, some of the upcoming webinars on August 8th, Dr. DiCarlo will give a webinar, and then in September, Larry Lake will give one. Uh, today's webinar is presented by Dr. Hugh Daigle, who's an associate professor in the Hildebrand Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering. He holds a BA degree in Earth and Planetary Sciences from Harvard University and a PhD from Rice University. Um, he has some industry experience at uh, Schlumberger Brigham Oil and Chevron, and his research includes fluid flow and porous media, geohazards, gas hydrates, and sustainable energy for the energy transition, including for hydrogen. And in fact, his topic today is the petrophysics of subsurface hydrogen storage. So if you have any questions at any time during the webinar, just post them in the Q&A section. And at the end, um, our speaker will get to them um, and answer th those questions. So with that, I'll pass it over to Dr. Daigle. All right, well, uh, thanks Matt for the nice introduction and uh, it's good to uh, see so many of you uh, here today. Um, I'm gonna talk about um, subsurface hydrogen storage, which uh, is a topic that I know is uh, a lot of you are interested in, I'm interested in, and it's, um, you know, I think it's gonna be an important thing going forward. Um, so uh, let's see, the specific topic I'll talk about today is the petrophysics of sub subsurface hydrogen storage, which is a little bit of a, of a niche topic, but as I'm gonna show you, I think it's actually extremely important and we need to pay close attention to it. So I'm gonna start off to motivate this work with a couple of slides I've actually borrowed from um, uh, uh, some, a webinar that um, Arvind Ravikumar and I did, uh, I think last summer. Um, just talking about the energy transition. So obviously um, we are undergoing a transformation within uh, the oil and gas industry where we've got you know, various companies um, taking these net zero pledges. So for example, you know, BP has taken a net zero pledge. Uh, Repsol, here's a figure from um, you know, one of their presentations. Um, Shell uh, is is you know leading the way on this a lot, and um, in particular um, hydrogen and uh, hydrogen made from um, steam methane reformation uh, is being viewed as a as a big uh, big part of how this is going to work. Now um, a lot of this is being driven by pressure both from the investment side and also from the government side. Um, a lot of countries are taking uh, net zero pledges. Uh, you know, China has made a pledge. Um, the um, you know we're looking at uh, you know various investors and investment groups that are uh, you know pushing these net zero goals. So you know it's important to listen to these and and respond to those. And also, if you look at the amount of emissions globally that are coming under these net zero pledges, it's really increasing a lot. This is a figure from 
uh, just looking at April 2021, 57% uh, of global emissions came with uh, some type of discussion about net zero. I think even more recently, that number has gone up um, a lot more. And when you look at the countries around the world that have, you know, or at least thinking about or have legislated um, carbon neutrality targets, there's, it's a large, a large number of countries. So this is something that's happening and it's something that we all need to be aware of. Now, one part of you know, net zero carbon emissions is using hydrogen. Hydrogen plays an important role and will continue to play an important role in how we achieve these net zero goals. So we can do this in a number of ways uh, with hydrogen. It's a good um, um, you know, candidate for what we call decarbonizing these hard to abate industries. So these are large industries that put out a lot of CO2 emissions um, and are difficult to remove those CO2 emissions uh, simply by virtue of you know, how those industries work. So two really good examples of this are cement manufacturing and steel making, um, which put out a lot of CO2 just because of the chemical processes that are involved in that. So hydrogen can be used in you know, for for as a fuel source and in various parts of the, the chemical uh, process there to try to reduce the CO2 emissions. Um, we can also use hydrogen as a feedstock for synthetic fuels. So you could think about combining hydrogen with CO2 that you pull out of the atmosphere to make syngas um, and essentially have a closed loop system where you're just cycling between syngas and CO2 um, as you combust it. Um, hydrogen itself can be used as a transportation fuel, either just as H2 or combined with ammonia. Um, and then you can also use hydrogen for electricity generation in a fuel cell. Um, the U.S. Department of Energy has a large hydrogen program. Um, they've put billions of dollars into this, which is very exciting. And um, what they see is that by 2050, we could potentially have a two and a half trillion dollar global market for hydrogen. And within the U.S., that market could be um, up to maybe three quarters of a trillion dollars. So it's, you know, the, the market could be out there for those who are willing to look into it. And, um, you know, there's, you know, a lot of different um, demand applications up to maybe, you know, 41 you know, billion tons of, of hydrogen being produced per year by 2050. So let's think for a little bit about how we are going to get this hydrogen. So I'm really thinking now about hydrogen that's made either from splitting water or from steam methane reformation with CO2 capture. Um, I know that there's a lot of talk recently about naturally occurring uh, hydrogen reservoirs in the subsurface. Uh, I think this is a really interesting topic and definitely worth paying attention to. Um, I think we still need to see whether that hydrogen is present in significant quantities that can be economically recoverable. But you know that's kind of a separate issue. So what I'm talking about today is hydrogen that you make and then you have to store and transport to the end users. So this is a fairly complicated diagram showing you the energy value chain. This is um, after a figure put together by the um, IEA from a report a few years ago. But the, you can divide it up into supply, handling, and demand. And obviously the supply is over here. A lot of people work on this. Um, what I'm talking about today is the handling component of this. So if you think about making, you know, millions and millions of metric tons of hydrogen every year, some of that is inevitably going to have to be stored somewhere. You can't just make it on demand. You're going to have to, for reasons I'll go into in a minute. So you're going to have to generate it and store it somewhere and get it to the end users. And to store the quantities that we're gonna to need to produce and we're gonna to need to use, you can't just store it in surface tanks. You need volumes that are much larger than that. So we have to start looking at subsurface storage um, to be able to do this in quantities that are enough to give us uh, what, we, what we need to, to meet the demand that we think we'll have. So, um, one way of doing this is what's called seasonal subsurface storage. Um, in my class that I teach, I like to talk about hydrogen being a fuel of opportunity. And this is something that whenever you have an excess of either electricity 
or um, natural gas or something like that, you can turn that excess supply into hydrogen and store it essentially like a battery. So you might not necessarily be making hydrogen all the time, but when you have the ability to do so, you can make it and then you'll have to store it somewhere. So these are some examples of how that might work. Um, in Europe, they talk a lot about using excess solar electricity generation capacity during the summer months to run electrolyzers, which then can produce hydrogen that's used during the winter months when you have less solar electricity generation, you make, can make up for that with you know, seasonal withdrawal from subsurface um, hydrogen storage. Uh, here in Texas, uh, we obviously know it's it's very windy. Um, it's particularly windy in the late winter to spring. These are average wind speeds in Midland um, from the National Weather Service. You can see these, you know, higher average wind speeds in you know March, April, May. Um, so when you've got excess supply of wind energy, you could also run electrolyzers with that and then store the hydrogen that you make um, to be used later um, on a day like today when it's going to be 104 degrees here in Austin. Um, another example is uh, looking at generating hydrogen from natural gas. So here's a plot of monthly gas production in the Permian Basin. That's this blue line. And then the orange line, this is energy use in the ERCOT far west region of Texas. And you can see that there are times of the year where you have upticks in energy use and then downticks in energy use uh, relative to kind of the seasonal cycles of, um, of natural gas production. So this is another situation where you might, you know, think about, you know, running your steam methane reformer and turning some of that, some of that excess gas into uh, hydrogen, which then can be used later. Uh, this interesting side note, this uh, might be a way of reducing the amount that gets flared, but that's probably a discussion for another time. So we're going to talk about storage here. So where can you store hydrogen in the subsurface? You can store it in four general classes of, of areas. Um, depleted gas fields. So these are gas fields that are at low pressure where you can pump the hydrogen back in there um, and then recover it later. Um, salt caverns, that's probably the easiest one to understand. We already store a lot of hydrocarbons in salt caverns. Um, and these you know, are just big, um, you know, brine filled open spaces where you can pump the gas in there and get it back easily. Um, saline aquifers are an interesting uh, choice. This uh, is similar to the idea behind uh, CO2 storage that you've got, you know, large pore volume in the subsurface that can be used to store hydrogen. And then um, kind of a smaller volume solution here would be abind abandoned mines um, and caverns in the subsurface that again, this kind of would function similar to uh, salt cavern storage. But um, what I'm going to focus on is storage either in depleted gas fields or saline aquifers. And the reason for this is that these have the largest storage potential. There is a huge amount of pore volume that's available for subsurface storage. But the difference in these two types of storage with respect to salt caverns or mines is that you're flowing through a porous medium. So you inevitably, it's going to be more complicated. You have to consider the petrophysics, the you know the poor scale flow, the larger scale flow. Um, it becomes a much more complicated problem. But if you can solve those problems, then you really have the possibility of in greatly increasing the amount of pore volume available for subsurface storage. So here's a really nice slide that I like to use to illustrate a lot of the issues involved with storing hydrogen. Um, either in a saline aquifer or in a uh, depleted uh, depleted gas reservoir. So what you can see here is that, um, so here's an injection well. Hydrogen is less dense than um, any gas out there. So buoyantly, it's going to want to sit at the top of the reservoir. Um, you'll have some kind of a cushion gas below that that will allow you to provide pressure support for getting the hydrogen in and out of the reservoir. Um, and then you'll have your brine sitting below that. So you can have all kinds of phenomena going on. Um, there can be mixing between the hydrogen and the cushion gas, which um, you know can not necessarily be a good thing. You have to worry about various processes during injection and withdrawal, including um, fingering phenomena, gravity override, the sort of thing that you that you have whenever you do gas injection. Um, hydrogen is highly reactive, um, and so it will react with the minerals that are present in your rock, particularly if you have um, 
uh, carbonate minerals. It's highly reactive with those. Um, also, microbes love hydrogen because it is a great source of energy. And so, you know, much more so than they love, um, you know, conventional natural gas. So you have to worry about the microbes eating your hydrogen and either turning it into methane or acetate. We'll get to that in a little bit. Um, there's also obviously the geomechanical aspects of storing the hydrogen in the subsurface um, where you've got to, you know, worry about cap rock integrity. The same thing you have to worry about with CO2 storage, um, diffusion across your seal, uh, the geomechanics uh, that, that happened down there. So there's a lot of different things that we have to consider when we're thinking about subsurface hydrogen storage in a porous medium from a petrophysical perspective. So let's dive into this uh, a little bit. So there are important differences in the physical properties uh, of hydrogen with respect to other gases. So I'm going to show some plots here uh, comparing hydrogen to uh, CO2, methane, and nitrogen. So here's a plot of density versus temperature at a pressure of 20 megapascals. And you don't have to look too closely at this, but just simply to notice the values on the y-axis for hydrogen are considerably lower than they are for the other gases. So, you know, hydrogen is at like, you know, between 10 and 15 kilograms per cubic meter. Uh, compare that to CO2, which is, you know, closer to, um, you know, uh, you know, a couple of hundred uh, kilograms per, per cubic meter. So it's much less dense. You're going to have much more buoyancy uh, driving force uh, governing the flow in the subsurface. Um, thinking about multi-phase flow, uh, hydrogen has a slightly lower uh, interfacial tension in contact with water than um, CO2, depending on the conditions. Uh, it's actually very similar to nitrogen in terms of its uh, interfacial tension. Um, so you have to think about how that's going to affect the capillary pressure um, and how the hydrogen is going to move around whenever it is a, um, a non-wetting phase. Uh, here's a plot of viscosity. So if you're thinking about your fingering phenomena when you're, you're injecting hydrogen, uh, it's got a much lower viscosity um, than uh, other gases. So this is comparing hydrogen, which is the solid lines, to um, methane, which is the dashed lines here. You can see that, you know, particularly at elevated pressures, that's, you know, 30 megapascals there. Um, you know, it's uh, it's it's you know more less than half the viscosity of uh, of methane. The other thing you have to worry about with with hydrogen because it's such a small molecule, um, it's got a large diffusion coefficient. So this is the um, you know coefficient of molecular diffusion when you know dissolved in water. You can see hydrogen sits up here, and that's compared to you know, CO2 and methane, which both behave similarly. Um, it diffuses much more easily through um, the material that make up pipelines. This is an issue for transport, but it also will diffuse across um, cap rocks much more easily. So that's something you have to worry about uh, for seal integrity. So just to wrap this part up, you know, the key differences with respect to other gases is that hydrogen is much less dense so it will undergo much more rapid buoyant migration. The buoyant um, forces are going to be larger. Um, it has a higher interfacial tension than other gases, so it will exist at a higher capillary pressure at a particular saturation. Um, it's got a lower viscosity, so it flows more easily under an induced pressure gradient, and it's got that higher diffusion coefficient, so you have to worry about it diffusing more rapidly uh, once it is in place. So let's think about some of the ramifications of this. So this here is the um, classic Lenormand diagram, which looks at how the displacement when you're injecting um, a non-wetting fluid into a porous medium con containing a wetting fluid, um, what that's going to look like depending on the balance of capillary and viscous forces. Um, so the x-axis here, this is the logarithm of the viscosity ratio, which is the ratio of the viscosity of the injected fluid to the uh, receding fluid. And then the y-axis here, this is the logarithm of the capillary number, which is uh, given by this ratio here. It's uh, viscous to capillary force um, 
ratio where you've got the viscosity and the velocity of the injected fluid um, divided by um, the uh, interfacial tension times the cosine of the uh, contact angle. And depending on where you fall in this diagram, you can either have stable displacement. So this is, you know, piston-like displacement. Um, you can have capillary fingering uh, if you've got a very low capillary number, or you can have viscous fingering if you have a very low viscosity ratio. So let's think about where you might fall here if you're injecting hydrogen into a saline aquifer. So let's imagine you're at 75 degrees Celsius. Um, we're not going to worry too much about the, uh, the pressure effect here because um, that doesn't have as much an effect on the viscosity or the, um, or the interfacial tension. So um, at these conditions, um, hydrogen viscosity is very low uh, as compared to the brine viscosity. It's about an order of magnitude lower. And so uh, the logarithm of our mobility ratio is going to be negative 1.6. And so regardless of what our capillary number is here, we're going to be plotting somewhere in this region here. That's where our, the logarithm of our viscosity ratio falls. So you're going to have a very hard time avoiding viscous fingering when you are injecting hydrogen at subsurface conditions. You're going to have to be very careful about, um, about how you inject this and also how you withdraw, how you withdraw the hydrogen. Um, so, you know, just like I just said, you're always very close to the point where you'd expect viscous fingering. Um, and so you can inject very, very slowly to try to overcome that. Um, so, you know, you can get the gravitational forces to dominate. And this is the situation actually where hydrogen actually helps you out because the buoyancy is so much stronger than it is with other gases that if you inject slowly, you can let that buoyancy take over. Um, you can also get around this by, you know, carefully choosing your, your cushion gas. Um, but you know what you want to avoid is is you know rapid injection where you get to the point where you've got fingering phenomena and eventually you get you know gas leakage out of your out of your trap. Um, the other thing that um, fingering phenomena do is that they increase the area of contact between the hydrogen and the brine. And what that means is that you'll have more chemical reactions there. You'll have reactions with the host rock. You also have micro reactions. Um, at the end of the webinar, I'll show a couple of slides illustrating you know, how this is a problem. So uh, that's another thing why you want to avoid fingering phenomena. So you've got to be really careful about, about how you inject. Now, another aspect of of the petrophysics of subsurface hydrogen storage I want to touch on is this idea of um, hysteresis uh, during injection and withdrawal. So I'm going to illustrate the effect of hysteresis um, actually by using a figure illustrating CO2 storage because um, it's kind of a similar idea. So let's imagine that you're injecting carbon dioxide into an anticlinal trap where you want it to sit up against the ceiling unit here. So you'll inject your CO2 and the CO2 plume will move uh, due to buoyancy. And what's gonna happen is initially where you inject the CO2, you'll have brine saturated rock. The CO2 will come in here. You'll have a you know, higher saturation of CO2 in the pore space. And then as the plume moves away, you'll actually have an imbibition phenomenon where the CO2 saturation decreases and the brine comes back. But because of hysteresis, you'll always have a little bit of trapped carbon dioxide. So you can see here in the zone where the plume has moved past, you still got residual CO2 here. Um, and, and obviously at the top of the reservoir, you've got a higher CO2 saturation. You can think about this in terms of a capillary drainage and imbi imbibition curve. So if I start over here initially at you know, full brine saturation, and I start injecting carbon dioxide, I'm gonna undergo drainage, and I'm gonna follow the drainage curve here. So, you know, you might get up to as, as high as, you know, your reducible water saturation. That's your residual water saturation, saturation right there. Then as the plume starts moving, um, the water, the brine will come back in and you'll have your imbibition curve. And the imbibition curve goes like this. It follows a different path from the drainage curve. That's why we call it hysteresis. And you end up down here at your residual gas saturation. So there's always some amount of the gas that you can't remove then because it's being trapped by um, capillary forces. So that's just for a single drainage imbibition cycle, which is what you have a lot of the time with CO2. Now, if you think about 
storing hydrogen in the subsurface seasonally. You're going to have multiple drainage and imbibition cycles, probably starting at different saturations. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And the situation becomes much more complicated. And the upshot here is that you have to worry about how much hydrogen you're going to leave behind that's going to be trapped and you can't get it back out. The other thing you have to think about is the relative permeability. So when you're injecting hydrogen, um, it's a you know typically considered a, a non-wetting or slightly non-wetting fluid in most um, you know silica um, you know sandstones, and so you have to think about it as um, you know gas phase relative permeability. So anytime that your um, the, the gas is your non-wetting phase. Um, your relative permeabilities will look something like this, that the relative permeability to the non-wetting phase generally is going to be higher than it is to the wetting phase. And the reason for that is if you think about the pore space that's occupied by each of those, the wetting phase is typically confined to the smaller pore spaces, pendular rings, that sort of thing, um, because the uh, you know it's really a, an energy uh, minimization issue. You want to minimize the curvature of the interface between the wetting and the non-wetting phase. So the non-wetting phase will be able to flow through the larger pore space and it will flow more easily under an applied pressure gradient. Um, it's only when you get to higher saturations and higher capillary pressures that you can really force the non-wetting phase into some of those smaller um, smaller channels. Channels, But generally, that's going to be what we see when we've got multi-phase flow. Um, but something can happen you know that these curves are affected by a whole bunch of different things and one of the things that affects the shape of your relative permeability curves is um, the wettability the contact angle so as this is an example looking at moving from water wet to oil wet but you can think about this also in terms of you know moving from hydrogen being highly non-wetting to being slightly non-wetting um, when you go from highly water wet to less water wet, what happens is the relative permeability to the water phase increases because the water has access to some larger pore space. But also, in this case, it's the oil relative permeability. Um, that's going to decrease because um, the oil will be pushed into some smaller pore space. And so what you can see here, this is plotting um, different relative permeability curves at different measures of wettability. This is US Bureau of Mines wettability test. Um, and you can see that when we go from water wet, which is positive values, to more oil wet, which is the negative values, um, the water phase rel perm increases, but the oil phase rel perm decreases. So that's you know really just illustrating what I just said. Now, how does this work with hydrogen? Well, there's some interesting studies. Um, this is a paper actually that's um, currently in review that I, I found a preprint of online, um, where showing that hydrogen is actually not strongly non-wetting um, in sandstones. So this is based on micro CT analysis of um, you know individual contacts in a Bentheimer, Bentheimer sandstone sample um, with DI water at room temperature. And you can see that, you know, these are a whole bunch of Gaussian curves looking at different populations um, using different methods. But generally, you can see your contact angles are somewhere around, I don't know, you know, 20 to 60 degrees. So it's not really that non-wetting. And so what that means then is when you think about the relative permeability, you're going to have a lower relative permeability to the hydrogen than you would with other gases. So this is a nice paper by uh, Lisi et al. Um, this is looking in Berea sandstone, uh, looking at relative permeability curves, comparing hydrogen to nitrogen. It's a little, these are a little hard to read, but you can look at the one over here with the, lo the uh, logarithmic y-axis, and you can see um, that uh, the hydrogen data do fall considerably lower than the nitrogen data. So, um, you know, what this means is that you're going to have to apply a higher pressure when you're injecting um, and you're going to have a correspondingly low um, relative permeability. Here's another, uh, a different paper um, looking again at Berea sandstone, uh, slightly different temperature, pressure and water uh, conditions, but Again, you can see, look at these, you know, these very low um, 
hydrogen relative permeabilities, even at, you know, moderate uh, gas saturation. So, you know, 50% gas saturation, you're still at only, you know, 0.1 relative permeability. Um, this, you know, can be fit pretty well with the modified brooks corey model, um, but it's a very, uh, you know, very low relative permeabilities. So this is a bit of a double-edged sword because you're going to have pressure limitations, obviously, when you're injecting. Um, but then you're going to remember I said that if you want to avoid your fingering phenomena, that you want to inject slowly. So, you know, maybe this isn't such a big problem if you're trying to avoid your viscous fingering. So that's just uh, something to consider. Okay, so that's simply relative permeability during drainage. Now, if we think then about what happens with hysteresis, relative permeability curves show drainage imbibition hysteresis the same way that capillary pressure curves do. And it's due to you know, similar phenomena. It has to do with the region of the pore space that the non-wetting phase occupies. Um, you can also have some minor wettability alteration during the, the drainage process, but so, you know, you can think about, so here's a, you know, primary drainage curve, here's imbibition, uh, excuse me, here's imbibition, and then here's secondary drainage. So that's your hysteresis and capillary pressure. You see a similar thing in relative permeability. This is looking at oil and water, but again, you see that during uh, imbibition, you've got a lower non-wetting phase relative permeability. So think then about trying to get your hydrogen out after you've already injected. You take those already very low relative permeabilities and you make them even lower. So here's a plot looking at hysteresis. This is from a very nice paper by Bo et al. Um, and you can see that, so here are some, some scanning curves here. So this is the primary drainage relative permeability curve here. And then depending on where you start your imbibition, you'll follow one of these scanning curves. And you can see that the um, hydrogen phase rel perm during imbibition is very, very low. Um, even, you know, again, looking at 35 to 40% gas saturation, you know, that's 0.02. That's a very, very low relative permeability. So um, getting the hydrogen out after you've injected it into a saline aquifer um, is going to be quite a challenge. And so I think you might be able to get around this with clever use of a cushion gas. I know a lot of people are looking at that, um, but it's, um, it's definitely going to be a challenge that we have to think about. Um, over here, this is um, just the um, you know land model showing you the uh, initial versus residual hydrogen saturation. It's, it's fit by this function here. Um, you know, looking at a whole bunch of uh, tests they did here. Um, this is the mod, the best fit model here. So you know, again, you can see that even um, you know for high initial hydrogen saturations, you get a low residual um, low residual saturation. Um, so hysteresis, I think, is um, an underappreciated problem, but I think that more and more people are are looking at it, and I, I hope we come to some, you know, way to get around to get around this for um, subsurface. So, how does this affect your recovery? Um, so, here's a simulation of storage um, uh, on the Norwegian continental shelf um, using a, a reservoir model it's from a nice paper by Lucia et al. that was published earlier this year. Um, so you can see that the one I want you to focus on is this third line down here. This is looking at multiple injection withdrawal um, cycles. You can see that using his, a hysteretic um, uh, relative permeability model, they uh, only eventually after five cycles got out 37% of uh, the initial gas that was that was put in there. So, um, you know, this is uh, going to be a problem, obviously, uh, if you want to maximize the amount of storage. So that's just something that has to be taken into consideration when you're looking at um, subsurface storage. Okay, so to wrap up this discussion of relative permeability and hysteresis, hydrogen appears not to be as non-wetting um, as other gases in sandstone. And this means that it's going to have a relative uh, permeability that's lower at a given gas saturation uh, than for other gases. Um, the hysteresis the, uh, effect is going to cause the recovery efficiency uh, to be low with this cyclical injection and withdrawal. And so I think this is, you know, a problem you could hand off to the reservoir engineers and say, you know, hey, come up with a way of doing this that's going to fix this. But it's definitely something that has to be taken into consideration. Okay, 
Um, the other petrophysical aspect that I want to talk about is microbes. So I mentioned that microbes love hydrogen um, because it's a really great, uh, really great source of energy. There's a whole bunch of different reactions that can happen depending on um, you know, the chemistry, the microbial species, and the oxidation state uh, that you have in the subsurface. And generally what you can see here is that you're going to take your hydrogen and turn it into either methane, uh, H2S, or some type of acetate. Um, you can also, you know, reduce, uh, end up with reduced iron plus water. So these obviously are things that you don't want. You don't want to turn your hydrogen into methane or acetate. You want it to stay as hydrogen. So, um, you know, what can we do to try to control these reactions? Um, it's, it's not an easy problem because you can't control the microbes. You know, the microbes control you. <laughs> microbes will eat your lunch and your hydrogen and take your lunch money too if you're not careful. So, um, you know, something you have to think about. So uh, a couple of years ago, there was a field test in Austria in a uh, depleted gas field. Uh, it was called underground sun storage. And they ran this um, for uh, over 2016 and 2017 um, with, you know, a fairly uh, sophisticated surface facility. Uh, injecting it into this depleted um, reservoir here. And here's a, uh, you know, model. You can see this nice, uh, you know, anticlinal feature here where you've got a good trap. You know, depleted gas reservoirs are really good for this because you don't really have to worry about seal integrity. The seal has already held the gas there. And as long as you haven't had any issues due to depletion, you can kind of assume that the, um, the, the seal will, will work for a subsequent storage. So they did a whole bunch of, you know, geomechanical and chemical and microbial characterization of this site um, before the test. So uh, what they did was they injected natural gas with 10% hydrogen. So, you know, not a very high hydrogen concentration. Um, injection went for three months, they shut it in for four months, and then they withdrew the gas over three months and looked at what happened. Um, they had little to no corrosion um, observed in their downhole equipment, which was good you know, as a result of the rigorous uh, testing they did. Um, they saw very little change in the physical properties of the reservoir, again, because they did their homework, um, made sure there wasn't pyrite, clay, sulfate bearing minerals, that sort of thing that would react with the hydrogen. But the real you know, issue here was the microbes. And when you look at um, you know, the gene sequencing, they saw that between um, you know, the two, two depths where they took samples, so 1,200 meters and 1,350 meters within the reservoir, um, they found that methanogens were the dominant, um, the, the, uh, the, the, the dominant um, species that was present, both looking at the DNA and the, and the RNA analysis. And um, what happened was that the methanogens then would react with carbon dioxide and hydrogen to make methane and water. And the issue here was that the carrier gas that they were using had 0.2% by volume CO2. So that's not a whole lot of CO2, but it was enough for the microbes you know, to get going and start degrading some of that hydrogen. So, you know, this is a situation where you want to be very careful about characterizing, you know, who's there, what microbes are down there, but also looking at the chemistry of the gas that you're injecting. Um, you know, if you're in a situation where you've got methanogens in the subsurface, you probably don't want to use carbon dioxide as your cushion gas because you're going to have adverse reactions at the gas interface there. So the takeaways from this are that it's pretty easy to reduce the mechanical and geological risk for doing subsurface storage. Um, we know how to do it, uh, rigorous laboratory testing, careful site location, you know, careful site selection. That's, that's all pretty straightforward. But reducing the microbial risk right now is still um, difficult um, because, you know, partly you're at the whims of whatever microbes are in the subsurface, which you can't control, but also understanding how they're going to interact with what you're actually injecting. Um, that's the part you can control, and I think we need to be aware of that to reduce um, this risk. Okay, um, I'm going to wrap up here with a couple of slides looking at the what I'm calling the microbe multiphase flow nexus. So how do these microbial interactions affect 
um, the multi-phase flow aspect. So this is a very nice paper by Lou et al. It came out um, earlier this year looking in a glass micro model at differences in um, wettability and, um, and flow properties uh, between a model that did have bacteria in it and a model that did not have bacteria in it. So um, they used a um, particular microbial species here that would react with sulfates and um, uh, and be um, um, you know stable in brine, which they use. And one thing you can see that I'm showing here, this is um, an aging experiment looking at the contact angle at the um, hydrogen water grain interface um, over time. What you can see is that the model that did not have any microbes in it, you're you know, stable between about 30 and 40 degrees. So again, that's consistent with the figure I showed earlier. But what's really interesting is that the microbes cause a very significant increase in contact angle, actually uh, going above 90 degrees. So you're going to intermediate you know, wetting here, even just, you know, hydrogen very slightly being the wetting phase. You can see, you know, this contact here being essentially flat, having very, very low curvature. Um, and so, um, you know, this is uh, a very interesting phenomenon that, you know, it's kind of the first time people are, people are looking at this. And so the question is, you know, is this good or bad? So if you're intermediate wetting, that actually means that the gas phase, the hydrogen, can occupy more of the pore space. And so it, you know, all of the things being equal will cause less residual trapping um, during withdrawal. So that is actually potentially a good thing. But here's the downside to this. Because the gas phase is occupying more of the pore space, the microbes have more access to it. And what they do is they'll start eating the hydrogen and they'll turn it into a whole bunch of disconnected bubbles. Those are the things that are gonna get trapped. Here's a figure looking at another aging experiment where they looked at the saturation of disconnected bubbles. And you can see that um, there was, you know, more than double the saturation of disconnected bubbles when, when bacteria were present. And this, you know, again, has to do with, with what's going on. Um, another thing you have to worry about is, you know, is there's a lot of bacterial activity, there's gonna be a lot of microbes, you know, that are metabolizing and then dying. And you've got a whole bunch of, you know, dead cells and stuff flowing around and those can cause significant, you know, biofilm formation and clogging and that sort of thing. So that can reduce your, your permeability. Another thing to consider is that um, in these experiments, the microbes were sulfate reducers, um, but at two of the more well-known field trials, both sun storage and then the high Chico test in Argentina, um, the microbes were methanogens. And so, you know, what's going to happen with wettability alteration, it probably, I mean, I don't know, but it probably is going to depend on what the microbial assemblage is, because it has to do with the products that the microbes are making. Um, and so, you know, that's, a whole wide open, you know, question that I think is is not resolved, and I think that uh, needs to be looked more into. So, really, again, I want to emphasize this, you know, micro multiphase flow nexus. I think that's the big thing that we need to be looking at as far as you know storing hydrogen in saline aquifers and depleted gas reservoirs. So um, I'm going to close here with some thoughts, really just to circle back um, to what I've talked about. So when you don't have microbes present, um, hydrogen is less non-wetting, okay, than other gases like nitrogen, methane, CO2, that sort of thing. So um, you already um, are at a penalty with respect to relative permeability. Um, and so that phenomenon plus the hysteresis that you show um, you know, just during typical drainage inhibition cycles um, could really reduce your recovery efficiencies um, during seasonal storage if you have multiple injection withdrawal cycles. But now if you include the microbial effect, they look like they have a big effect on wettability and also the flow behavior. Um, and it's a much bigger effect than with conventional gas um, because, you know, the hydrogen just tastes better. The microbes love it. And so they'll, you know, really go to town on it. And there's, you know, just there's a lot of unknowns about all of these processes that I think still need to be worked out. 
And I think it's a really interesting area of research. And I encourage all of you to go out and start working on it because we want to make you know, subsurface hydrogen storage happen, we need to solve these problems. And it's a really cool area to be looking at because there are so many open questions and, you know, the potential to, you know, make significant impacts um, with, the, you know, um, you know, by looking at these fundamental problems. So um, we've come to the end. I'd like to, you know, thank you all for being here. I think we're going to move into the uh, the Q&A session. Um, again, remember, please type your Q&A into the, uh, to the chat and, uh, well, type your Q into the chat and then um, I hopefully will give you an answer. Okay, so uh, the first question I see here is, um, what are the potential geochemical reactions and how might they affect the petrophysics? Okay, so that's a, that's a really good question. I did spend more time talking about the microbes than I did about the geochemistry. Um, really, the, um, I think the, the big issue is that you have uh, these dissolution and reprecipitation reactions that can happen um, involving sulfate or yeah, sul sulfur bearing minerals and, and iron bearing minerals. Um, and so anytime that you're dissolving and reprecipitating things, you know, we see this with subsurface CO2 storage also. Um, the precipitation will often occur in places that the initial dissolution wasn't happening. So, you know, think about maybe hydrogen reacting with clay. The clay is going to be, you know, in smaller pores and pore threats and that sort of thing. But then um, you might get precipitation in some of your larger pores. And so I think there's, you know, significant um, risk for clogging, um, clogging your permeability. Um, then also you have to think about the, you know, geomechanical implications of that, particularly um, if you've got, say, anhydrite or gypsum in your seal, uh, if you're removing um, some of that miner those minerals, you can compromise the, uh, the seal capacity. Okay, um, next question. Oh, this is an easy one. How do we get a copy of the presentation? So this will be posted to our YouTube channel within a few days after we do some post-processing. Um, but if anybody um, wants, you know, slides or that sort of thing, I encourage you to, you know, get in touch with me. Um, I'm happy to share stuff. None of this stuff is is private. So, you know, please do, uh, please do reach out to me. That's a, that's a real good question. Has storing hydrogen in porous media proven to cause some unique fine migration in reservoirs, which may cause formation damage during cyclic loading and unloading? Um, so that's that's a good question. I'm not aware of any literature out there, and this is partly because of just lack of you know field trials or or quite frankly experimental evidence. Um, I you know somebody can you know. So some of y'all might know better than I do about, you know, um, work that might be ongoing, but I, I'm not aware of that even having been looked at. Um, you know, when I think about fines migration, a lot of the time it's due to issues where you've got, you know, salinity differences. And um, you can have this sometimes with, you know, gas injection and production due to a um, Joule-Thompson effect, which can, you know, change the uh, stability conditions for your fines. That's definitely a consideration for hydrogen. I wouldn't be surprised if you saw that, but, um, you know, and then looking at the cyclic loading or unloading, um, that's another thing that has to be has to be considered. I know that that's something they think about with salt caverns. And you know you definitely want to look at that in terms of characterizing the integrity um, of your trap. So you know it's the you know the whole thing, the whole way that you would characterize just a, a typical gas injection scenario. You know you need to think about that here in addition to the microbes and the and the geochemical reactions. I think that's a really good, real good way of thinking about it. Would methane be a better option as a cushion gas? Um, well, yeah, I mean it can be. It's um, you know it depends. Um, you know, there's kind of some economic considerations there, but also, again, it really comes back to, um, you know, what the microbial assemblage is. If you've got, you know, bugs that like to eat methane, um, then, uh, you know, that might not necessarily be a good thing. Um, but I know actually there's, you know, uh, a lot of people have, you know, said methane might be the best uh, the best cushion gas. The, the real drawback there is really just economic because you're taking something that is valuable, uh, you know, much more valuable than say CO2, and are you simply using it as a cushion gas? So, you know, that's kind of an economic consideration that, you know, I think you, uh, I think you have to look at.
Here's another question. Um, what is the role of the cushion gas in the discussions around the capillary pressure and rel perm curves? That's a really great question. I'm not aware of any work that has looked at three phase rel perm behavior um, in this context. There, you know, there's probably some out there, but I think that's a really good question. And all the stuff that I said about hysteresis and you know inhibition drainage, it becomes much more complicated in that situation. And you know, I'd be really interested to see uh, to, to see some work on that. That's a really that's a really good question. What about the volumetric aspects of hydrogen storage? Um, have there been any equations or model to estimate reservoir storage capacity, which is not the usual gas in place equation um, commonly used for gas reserve estimation? Um, to my knowledge, uh, we are still estimating storage capacity the way we are uh, for conventional gases. Um, and so obviously, if you've got microbes consuming the gas, and chemical reactions consuming the gas and these effects with hysteresis, that's something you need to take into consideration. But um, to, to my understanding, that's, you know, we're still using, you know, conventional natural gas engineering uh, framework uh, to look at that. Next question, what is the origin of these microbes and what's the impact of temperature on them when we're dealing with deep reservoirs? So the origin of the microbes is, you know, a lot of them, and you, you know, I, getting out of my element a little bit here, not being a microbiologist, but a lot of them evolve for, you know, to exist in the particular pressure and temperature and chemical conditions where they live. You know, so these microbes that are in the subsurface, um, you know, you can bring a sample up to the surface and reculture them in a laboratory, but you're not going to find them just like if you dig up the soil outside or something, they're not there. They live in the subsurface. And, you know, I think this question about perturbing the pressure and temperature, um, I think that's a really interesting, um, you know, that's a really interesting question because, again, like I said, they evolve to exist at particular conditions. And if you perturb those conditions, that might be a way to control some of their behavior. So I talked a little bit about controlling the chemistry, but, um, you know, there's also a, a you know, pressure and temperature component. Um, that you could that you could think about um, when you're looking at you know very deep, very hot reservoirs. Um, you know that comes becomes a big problem because there's you know a lot of the microbes down there. We don't know much about them, so that's um, you know a cool area to look in. But there's a lot of unknowns uh, unknowns with that. Oh yeah, this is a good one. What are the main downsides of considering depleted oil fields for hydrogen storage? Well, I think from a petrophysical perspective, uh, anytime you have a liquid non-wetting phase, uh, you do run the risk of having dissolution. Now, I, you know, I'm kind of talking off the cuff here. I don't know what the, you know, partition coefficient is for, um, you know, hydrogen into crude oil uh, when you've got them in contact with each other. Um, but, you know, basically there, there's that aspect. And then the multi-phase flow aspect becomes very, very difficult as well. Um, it's a lot easier to deal with, you um, uh, depleted gas that is, you know, kind of that residual saturation than it is to deal with depleted oil that's that residual saturation um, because, uh, you know, a lot of it has to do with the contrast in, in viscous properties of, of what you're injecting and what, what you're trying to withdraw. Um, so, you know, I'm not saying it can't be done in depleted oil reservoirs, but um, it, be, it becomes a much more um, complicated problem. So, you know, the, the gas reservoirs are kind of the, the low hanging fruit, so to speak. If at pore scale, hydrogen is in the viscous fingering regime, are conventional relative permeability curves appropriate? Oh, that's a really great question. Um, and, you know, I, I think the short answer is no, because with the conventional rel perm models, we're always assuming piston-like displacement. So, you know, you're essentially using the relative permeability as a, as a sort of heuristic model. And, you know, what's interesting when you think about that is that it's not really just the wettability issue that might be giving you extremely low rel perms, but it could be the fact that, you know, you're always in this fingering regime. And, um, you know, that could be affecting the, the measurements um, the, the, the measurements that you make. Um, if I'm not mistaken, some of the results that I showed in there from the micro CT experiments um, 
were in situations where, you know, they have some images in that paper where it didn't look like the fingering was actually that severe. So um, they were able to to control that. So, you know, but yeah, yeah, that's absolutely right. That's, you know, definitely something you have to you have to think about when you're thinking about the multi-phase flow aspect. Regarding the effect of microbes on wettability, how is it going to affect the trapped hydrogen saturation relative or following the imbibition process? Um, is it intuitive or is there any research paper on this? So um, I think that the, the one paper that I showed with the micro model, that's probably the best place to start um, in, in thinking about this. But, you know, like I was saying, I think the big issue is you have to think about what the products of the microbial reactions are and what those are doing at the interfaces um, to change the wettability. I think that, you know, using the word intuitive, you know, to a chemist, if you tell them what all the, you know, reaction products are, maybe it's intuitive, but I think that there's a lot of complicated stuff going on there. Um, and that, you know, that's an open question. Um, I'd love to see some work done on that. It's really, really that's you know, what I love about, you know, this topic is that there's just so much cool stuff to think about. And you all are asking some really great questions. This, has been, this is a lot of fun. Hydrogen seems to have much different fluid properties than other gases. Yes, it does. Are different flow or diffusive flux models necessary for properly, properly simulating storage compared with methane or CO2? Um, I think the short answer there is no. Um, you know, we know what the properties are, and although they're different, um, I think they're still well handled by you know the reservoir simulators that we have. You know, my my colleagues here in CSEE, um, you know, Dr. Stefanori and Dr. Delshad, you know, they've done some you know what I think are pretty good simulation work um, where you know the the results look like they make sense. So I think at least from that perspective, we can use existing tools to to investigate this. Here's a question: Why is a cushion gas necessary? So a cushion gas is necessary. It really alleviates a lot of the um, fingering and pressure response issues that I talked about. So it's easier to, you know, push from below with a cushion gas than it is to suck with a straw from within your your hydrogen reservoir. The uh, the displacement efficiency is a lot better. Um, so you know, obviously, you're still going to have all these you know hysteresis effects. Um, that I've talked about, but it, it helps out a lot, um, a lot with that. And it's it's commonly even used now in you know conventional gas gas storage. Um, uh, I mentioned hydrogen reacts with carbonates. As long as I know, the majority of gas reservoirs are giant carbonates. Yes, that's right. Doesn't mean we'll be facing issues with abandoned gas reservoirs for un for underground hydrogen storage. So you know the the question there is. I think you've got to think very carefully about the specific reservoir that you're injecting into, because a lot of this has to do not just with the mineralogy of the rock, but also the chemistry of the fluids that are already down there and also the microbes. So, you know, I, I think it certainly can be done. You can certainly store hydrogen in some of these giant carbonate fields. Um, you just have to be very careful and do your, do your homework beforehand. Um, I think the underground sun storage project is a good blueprint for what that homework has to be. Um, and I think that, you know, we can do that, you know, uh, definitely capable of it. It just needs to be um, something you consider. Uh, how do the microbes change the contact angle of, of the hydrogen? Um, they would have to interact with the surface of the, uh, or interact to change the surface of the rock or produce some chemicals which change the surface property of the rock. So, yes, I think the second part of that is correct. My understanding is that they are making things that are interacting with the surface of the rock to change the wettability. It's um, it's not the, you know, microbes itself, but it's what they're producing. And, you know, I think it's a good question about why that's happening. Okay, well, I think that's all we have time for. Um, again, thank you all for, for sticking around um, and uh, hope to see you at the uh, next webinar in August for uh, Dr. DiCarlo. Thank you so much, Hugh. That was a terrific talk and uh, thanks for the audience and for the many excellent questions. We had so many this time we couldn't get to them all, but I'm sure if you email Dr. Daigle, he'd be happy to answer them for you. Uh, as a reminder, this will be posted on YouTube within the next few days, along with dozens of other old webinars we have. So feel free to share those, uh, those uh, webinars with your colleagues and let your colleagues know about our live webinars. And um, we will see you next month.